Hi, I'm Rachel, and I feel like I can say with some certainty now that we're in the second half of 2022 that this is not the best year for me. <laughs> uh, I've had a pretty serious cat health scare and uh, buttressing that, which was a, the spring problem. In the winter, I had a serious uh, Wi-Fi disconnect problem that I had to fix, and uh, now my AC in the summer isn't working. I think something got jostled at a recent uh, thunderstorm in the area, I in mean, the DC area. But anyway, the important thing is that my AC is not working properly. You might be able to hear the fan kind of uh, whirling uh, heavily in the background, uh, but uh, there's not much I can do about it now. I'm still in the midst of trying to solve this latest problem, but uh, yeah, it's been a tough uh, year so far, uh, <laughs> which I could do with a little bit of a break. Uh, and uh, in this case, it's led to me, uh, I'm, I'm using it as my big excuse, <laughs> that uh, I'm filming this video uh, later than I hoped. I was hoping to film it a handful of days ago, probably by this point, but it's okay. This is sort of a weird video. It's like a uh, reading checkup video, but I'm not calling it a Friday Reads, even though I'm filming it on Friday, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, probably because, you know, now we're like significantly into July, and this is technically the reading I wanted to finish up for June. And in fact, it's uh, the last three books that I put in on my um, June literary newsletter because I uh, publish a literary newsletter every month on my blog. It has snippets of my Goodreads reviews because I review every book I read on Goodreads and I have uh, literary news that caught my fancy in the month and a book pick and a book meme and so I can officially link uh, that uh, link <laughs> down below and uh, talk about uh, the three final books that I haven't really mentioned that much uh, or at all in some cases uh, in other videos. So just a quick uh, little update, I think, uh, just to <laughs> stay on track here and to get into my uh, July book tubing. Uh, so anyway, uh, the book I have mentioned, uh, especially in my mid-year freakout check-in tag, check-in freakout tag, is uh, Night at the Fiestas by Kirsten Valdez Quaid, which is a short story collection I read recently and I, you know, really loved it, so I talked about it a lot as a, you know, a top read in that video, which I'll link below. Uh, so, uh, this really has put uh, Kirsten Valdez Quaid on my radar. I read her uh, novel for the Booktube Prize, The Five Wounds, which actually was um, expanded from a short story in this collection. <laughs> so that is pretty cool. Uh, these are the types of short stories that are on the longer side. They're like 25 page short stories and there's just so much happening in them that it's not that surprising that she's the type of uh, writer who could turn them into novels because there is that promise or potential. But speaking as a short story writer, I like stories like this. They don't have to be novels. They give you a full world and they give you sort of something to grasp onto and think about in a complex way about characters and their situations. And uh, you don't have to make it longer than that. But I guess I can see the appeal of doing it too, because once you fall for these characters, you kind of want more of them. <laughs> but yeah, this I think to me is like the type of short story writing that's my absolute favorites. And I spent time in that video comparing her to like my favorite short story writers like uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and Jhumpa Lahiri. And I feel like she's in that vein in that, uh, yeah, she's writing these long and complex stories, like the beauty of the stories. You know, she's a competent writer, but it's in not flowery language as much as, you know, really giving you fully uh, realized characters and situations um, and really can stop and make you think. Uh, so, yeah, I really uh, liked uh, this collection a lot, although ironically it was named for one of my less lesser favorite stories, but really most of these stories really packed a wallop. These next two books I haven't talked at all about on this channel yet, at least not outside of the book haul uh, variety of teasing them when I got them, uh, but they were at the top of my Goodreads list. I call it the top of the Goodreads. Uh, and I have this uh, resolution from the beginning of the year where I took a bunch of titles that are at the top of my Goodreads and said, okay, you have to read them this year. And then I scheduled them all. And these are the two that I scheduled for June. Uh, the first one is uh, Even in Darkness uh, by Barbara Stark 
Martin Neiman, which is uh, self-published with She Writes Press. I think I keep on saying, like, I haven't read a She Writes Press novel, and I'm sure this is at least my second one this year. So anyway, this is a, a Holocaust novel, and I try to be pretty uh, discerning with Holocaust novels. I don't want to overdo it with them. You know, there's so many and I want to explore more in, you know, the Jewish story and so forth. Uh, but for some reason, this caught my my fancy when I heard about it a few years ago, and that's when I put it on my Goodreads TBR, and then it, you know, kept uh, rising on the list. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this uh, story is also uh, autobiographical about uh, the author's uh, great aunt. This woman named Claire Kohler, who, uh, was a young woman in Germany when uh, the Holocaust uh, was going on and more importantly I guess the uh, years leading up to the Holocaust because technically it's a novel that they say you know, she says spans a hundred years although really the majority of the years in question are you know the late 30s and early 40s uh, so there's that uh, and in that vein you know it captures not only the horror of the Holocaust but the horror of uh, what was leading up to the Holocaust, because uh, when Hitler came to power, uh, you know, it was just slowly stripping away the rights of the Jews, so that it was in these increments where, at the beginning of it, you would have no idea that, uh, you know, where, you know, where this would ultimately end. I mean, it's just so unthinkable at the beginning, and to think of how dehumanized they were by the end, uh, but uh, even the smaller losses of uh, civil liberties were so like unthinkable in the beginning uh, because uh, Jews uh, were emancipated in, in Germany and like uh, generally felt themselves part of the larger society and you know fought in the Great War and etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's where Claire Kohler is coming from and her family her husband who was a veteran of the Great War and uh, their two sons and it just it follows them it follows uh, them ultimately finding a way to get their two sons out of the country, but they themselves, you know, first out of denial and then out of, you know, lack of options, aren't able to leave. Uh, so they do end up in a camp for a little bit, uh, although then afterwards uh, they both survive and uh, are able to come back to Germany, which is another sort of culture shock thing about, you know, coming back to a place where your countrymen, you know, t yanked you away from and said you have no more rights and also, you know, the bombed out, you know, reality of, Germany after the war. I mean, I feel like all of that stuff is just sort of the intrinsic historical background. Uh, I kind of wish, especially that latter part about uh, what it was like coming back was a little better explored. Although there was an interesting story that came out of that with Claire Kohler who spent her the rest of her life after her husband died shortly after the war. She um, lived with uh, this priest who was a young boy who uh, she knew growing up. I mean, well, he was, she was like um, his mother's age, like a friend of his mother. And ultimately they live together and she, you know, keeps her religion a secret, but they, you know, have a quiet little life together and, you know, are sort of able to reclaim sort of a love of humanity together, it seems like. So, I mean, it's an interesting premise, but I do feel like the writing is a little bit, uh, stuffy and passive sometimes, although there are occasional, you know, scenes in here that can be kind of riveting, although to a certain degree it's just because of the subject matter. Uh, I gotta say, you know, obviously, you know, the tension, the external tension is always so high. Uh, so, so I guess it was an okay book, compelling enough, uh, but uh, I don't think it would, you know, rise to a favorite or anything like that. And finally, the last book I'll talk about here is also uh, historical fiction uh, about uh, the Jewish community, but slightly different. But anyway, it is uh, The Museum of Extraordinary Things by Alice Hoffman, uh, which takes place uh, around 1911, about uh, around Coney Island and also a little bit into Manhattan and other parts of New York at that time. Uh, and I said it's a Jewish novel, but it's actually not just a Jewish novel because it follows, particularly follows uh, two characters, two main characters, one of whom is Jewish, who is a uh, man named uh, Eddie, uh, formerly Ezekiel, who uh, was born in the Ukraine, uh, but uh, he and his uh, father escaped after a pogrom where his mother was killed, and they end up in America, uh, living on the Lower East Side and sort of struggling to, you know, keep afloat, uh, you know, as a uh, you know, poor people there. Uh, and then 
The second story is about this uh, young woman named Coralie who has a uh, deformity, like in her hand, she has webbed hands, and her father happens to be sort of this uh, you know, collector of, you know, the so-called freaks of nature, you know, for that uh, whole circus uh, freak show sort of, uh, you know, gestalt of that, uh, you know, this I think is also around the time of P.T. Barnum. Uh, and it's definitely a book that, you know, I don't think it like hits you over the head with how immoral it is. Although I guess to a certain degree, like you can tell how immoral it is to treat, you know, people with deformities like, you know, they're freaks of nature. Uh, and uh, the story of Coralie and her father is deeper and darker than it might appear on the surface to begin with. Although by the end, when we found out you know, the whole, their whole true backstory. I, I wasn't too surprised by the reveals. Not that I'm not somebody who really cares about that. I don't care about being shocked. In fact, I would rather things make more narrative sense than not. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, a lot of the story is in fact backstory. I mean, the main, uh, I guess, uh, present day 1911 action is about this murder mystery that these two characters both become involved with. And it touches upon particularly themes of, uh, of poverty and uh, class justice and, you know, the Triangle Shirtweight Factory fire uh, takes place during this uh, book as well. Uh, and uh, that part is intriguing. The uh, overwrought love affair between Charlie and uh, Coralie, not so much for me. <laughs> uh, but their backstories, which technically are very separate from each other, that's what intrigued me the most. I felt like they were really authentic relationships, like Coralie with her uh, sort of uh, nursemaid and uh, her father's, uh, you know, uh, I guess, made around the house, uh, Maureen. Uh, that was an intriguing relationship, and also with a couple of the other uh, acts in the freak show. And then with uh, Eddie, especially with his father, they have a really contentious uh, relationship, and it, it uh, leans into why Eddie sort of stopped being religious, because his father is religious. Uh, and it's, it's more complicated than just, you know, uh, something completely antagonistic. I mean, there's back and forth about, uh, you know, who's at fault here, and uh, I think that's what makes Eddie particularly a compelling character because you can see his own faults, and you could, but you can also see the ways that he's been, you know, abused by society. Uh, so that, that stuff was the most compelling to me, even though it's all actually backstory, although it's, you know, less, you know, passive reportage or anything, and there's, you know, actual scenes and dialogue, but technically it feels like that's not the real story, you know, that's Hoffman maybe even uh, getting away with something that most authors can't get away with in stories about making the backstory like half of the story, whereas the main plot is supposed to be this murder mystery, uh, but I liked <laughs> the backstory better. I guess I'm just much more of a character-driven sort of, uh, I guess, reader, uh, and uh, it wasn't coming together to me for me, at least uh, Coralie and Eddie together, alas. <laughs> so, yeah, it was interesting, because this is the second historical fiction novel I've read by Hoffman. I read her The Dove Keepers a few years ago, and I really loved it. It was one of my favorite books of the year. There was a similar scene in this one, too, with uh, the main female character coming up against a lion to sort of prove her bravery, which also happens in The Dove Keepers, which is a story that takes place uh, at the Siege of Masada about 2,000 years ago. Uh, so I think maybe Hoffman intrigues me as a historical uh, fiction writer. I actually have never read, you know, Practical Magic or the sequel, and I don't think I'm that interested. But I, maybe I should give more of her historical fiction a try, but this one didn't work for me as well as uh, The Dove Keepers, but uh, I still I enjoyed it to a degree. <laughs> and that about covers it for me now. I'm going to go ahead and try to get this uploaded and on the internet so that I can keep on keeping on with July booktubing, because I'd like to be back on this channel in the next couple of days to do my latest page 112 tag. I used the page 112 tag to cull my physical unread books where I choose a book for my TBR for the month solely by reading page 112 of the books I randomly choose to read. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that. I hope you are all staying comfortable in your homes and not having any problems with your own utilities. <laughs> Maybe I'll have uh, better news to share soon. Uh, we shall see. But in the meantime, 
Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.